Thank you all for coming. I'm Chris. Um, I work for Twitter, obviously. I wear the Twitter shirt and no one of you is, so I'm the Twitter guy. Um, I live in Hawaii, so the last time I was in Ukraine, and by the way, I like Ukraine really much. It's, it's a really nice country. Last time I was in Kiev in March, it was snowing, like it was freezing cold, right? Yeah, I, I didn't like this. Today, pretty nice, so thank you for that. Um, first of all, most important question of the day, who has a Twitter account? Hey, Yahoo! Yeah, there are a few people who don't. You should ask. So, should ask. stand up and go away. Exactly, that's. But I'm not doing it because it's, it's not my event. And at my event, all these people would have to leave. Um, so, I encourage you to tweet about this talk and also not my talk, but the other talks as well. And um, Twitter has a small VM team. And it's a team of four core people that work on the JVM, and there are three GC engineers, and the GC engineers are basically 24-7 busy, you know, handling GC issues with our microservices. And then there's a compiler engineer, and that's me. So I'm doing the fun stuff. All the other people work, and I'm actually touring around and talk to you people and things like that. So if you're going to tweet about this talk, I would like you to add this hashtag TwitterVM team so that my other colleagues know that I was actually here and you guys liked it or not, you know, whatever. You have a personal hashtag to what? Me? On the slide. Well, it, yeah, it's my Twitter handle, but, you know, it's, it's more about the hashtag. Good. Um, so why this talk in general? I give a lot of talks about Graal, and the main purpose of my, my talks is I want you guys to try it out. And the reason I want you to try it out, there are multiple reasons. Number one is you could potentially save money, like we do at Twitter. We use Graal because we save a lot of money by doing it. Uh, I want to fix bugs that Graal still has because it's still an experimental chip compiler, and so if we throw more shitty code at it, right, because you, you can only run spec JBB so many times and find the same bugs over and over again until you have all them fixed. But you, what you really want is to run the shitty production code that you are using, that should be running with Graal. And then we, we would find a lot of bugs. And at the same time, if we do this, um, we would find new patterns that are maybe not as well optimized yet as they should be, and we could improve Graal, like the performance uh, of the compiled code in general. So this, 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 these are the main reasons why I'm giving this talk. And, um, when people actually try it, or after my, I have another talk, I'll talk a little bit about that later, but um, after my talks, people then usually come to me and say, oh, is it safe to use, right? Because it's an experimental compiler, so <laughs> I can tell you, we at Twitter, we use it for our main services in production for over 10 months now, I think, and our data centers are still fine. They're not on fire, they're still up and running, and uh, all the people who have Twitter accounts, did anyone lose any tweets or anything? No, right, runs fine. So then the question I get is how do I use it and where do I get it, right? And so especially these two questions we're going to answer today. And then when people actually try Graal, then sometimes I get an email, they run their favorite benchmark they are running for, for you know, many, many years now, and they're, they're mostly complaining about the benchmark numbers, and then they say kind of, oh, Graal sucks. And the reason why they do this is because they don't understand the differences between the existing JIT compilers and Graal. So it, it has different properties and we're going into detail a little bit later. So I, I, I have to ask a few questions. Um, who knows what a JIT compiler is? Yeah, that's not bad. Um, so a JIT compiler in a nutshell is, is basically taking uh, Java bytecode and translates it into native code so that your application runs faster. And it does that just in time while you're running your application, right? You're not compiling it like C++ with GCC or anything. Uh, you just have your class files and that gets uh, compiled into native code. That's a JIT compiler, okay? Good, we're talking about this more. So remember that. If you wanna know more about the money saving part, you should watch that video on YouTube. There are a bunch of versions of it. Uh, Twitter's quest for holy grail runtime. I basically explain the whole journey I did at Twitter, joining Twitter, finding a bunch of bugs, trying to run services on Graal, and then uh, you'll see a whole lot of graphs explaining to you where, where we are saving and why we are saving and how much we are saving. So very interesting, at least I think. Well, I gave the talk, of course it's interesting. Um, so what is Graal? Okay, I already explained, JIT compiler, 
top of virtual machine, everyone knows that, everyone knows Hotspot, what Hotspot is, right? The JVM of OpenJDK. So uh, Graal is actively developed by Oracle Labs. So there is a, there's an official OpenJDK project called Graal. Uh, the source code lives on GitHub and it uses something called JVMCI, which is a, a Java, JVM, uh, yeah, we talk about this a little later more as well, but it's a, it's a compiler interface, uh, it's a, a Java compiler interface, so you can plug in external compilers like Graal, for example, okay? And then Graal is written in Java, okay? So if you're going to take away one thing today, of my talk at least, then it's this, it's written in Java. And it's very important because Java has very, very different properties than C++. And Hotspot has, okay, quest, next question, who knows what C1 and C2 are? Okay, so Hotspot today has two chit compilers and one is called C1 or client compiler and the other one is called C2 or server compiler. You might remember the flag stash client dash server, they're kind of obsolete now, but um, there are two chit compilers, C1 and C2, and they're both written in C++. And Graal is written in Java, and you all know that C++ and Java have very, very different properties, okay? So always remember this, and that's also the problem that people had when they were complaining about benchmark numbers, and, and we'll see that when I, when I do all the demos later. Uh, I'll do a lot of demos, by the way, um, and I hope the power will stay on. So, number one, where do I get it, right? Okay, so there are two ways to get it. I mean, that's, that's not really true. But there is CHEP 295, which is a ahead of time compilation. So we added ahead of time comp compilation while I was still working at Oracle. Uh, and the way ahead of time compilation works, it uses Graal as a code generating backend. It's, it's pretty much a Java application, a command line tool more or less. It, it reads in Java classes or Java files or whatever, and then compiles it into a native library. That's it, and it uses Graal, and that's why there's actually a way to use Graal in JDK 9. But since JDK 10, we have CHEP 317 experimental Java-based JIT compiler, and that's actually officially Oracle-approved way of using it. It's still, it's still experimental, so it's not, you can't go to Oracle and really request support for it, but it's there, okay. So let's do this. Um, here's the interesting part. So I'm, I'm part of the Oracle Developers Champions program and through that program I get free Oracle Cloud credits and I can use their cloud for free. And we are going to use the cloud for all my demos today. And the way I do this, you know, when you, when you go to a, to a presentation like this one and people are doing demos and when I watch these presentations, I always wonder how many hours that these people spend to make sure that the demo will work, right? So I do a completely different approach. Um, I have nothing prepared. Like I I'm, will right now log into the Oracle Cloud. I will fire up a cloud instance that's completely empty. It doesn't even have Java installed. So everything we're doing, to, and this can go wrong by the way, and it did two days ago, so we'll see. Uh, and everything I do today, there's, there's, there's no cheating. Like everything I do today, that's what you have to do if you want to run on Graal, for example. Okay, a lot of things can go wrong, as I said. Um, there's also Wi-Fi is always a problem, or at least I'm worried about it. Um, and then there's also a lot of typing going on. You know, typing in front of people is always an issue, so a lot of typos. Uh, we will also be downloading a lot of stuff that will lead to some awkward pauses where no one speaks. So I wish when, at the very beginning, he was, he was you know, introducing and, and you know, welcoming you all, and he was playing like this chess music in the background. You, you notice that? I should have that for the awkward pauses, like have a little bit of chess music in the background. Good, well let's create this instance. Let's see if it works. And since this is not an Oracle sponsored event, if it doesn't work, it's Oracle's fault. <laughs> Never mind. Good, okay, here we go. So we call this Lviv, and then we do it in this domain. I use the Oracle 7.4 because I've never tried 7.5 so far. Could you, could you please slightly zoom in? Zoom in? Is it possible or not? Um, 
I already made it as big as possible. Okay. If I zoom more in, then I can't. Yeah, sorry. That's okay, no. You should get bigger screens. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> it's not my zooming in. <laughs> right. So we're going to we're going to choose this guy here that has four CPUs because if you want to run a JVM in a you know always. You want a couple more of cores because you want, for example, your GCs to run in parallel, right? If you run on one core, I mean, that's stupid. Your GCs will never run in parallel. So we do this, then we need a bunch of SSH keys so that I can actually log in. And this should all be set up. And then we click on create instance. And then we cross our fingers that it works today. And yeah, hopefully it will. So what we're looking for down here is we want a public IP address that should pop up right now, there you go. It's amazing how, how good I timed this. It's unbelievable. Um, and then, this is the part that gets me worried because they might have changed something, like this provisioning part that only took five, six seconds and then it turned green and said running, but now it seems to take a little bit longer and it always makes me a little nervous. So, uh, and this will take a while because the provisioning will take, take a while, the imaging will take a while, and then starting up the Linux uh, system will take a while. So in the meantime, I'll switch over to slides and talk about something else. And two days ago, I didn't notice that it was never coming up. So um, I'm just waiting for this to turn green because then I'm basically good to go. Awkward pause, some chess music. Where the, where's the band? <laughs> we should have live chess music during my pauses. Okay, I'm not waiting for it. I don't know how long it takes. They must have changed something. They always change, oh, ah, excellent, much better. Okay, so this will take now a few minutes. And um, in the meantime, I'm talking about myself a little bit, who I am. So as I said, my name is Chris Thalinger. Um, I work obviously for Twitter. Uh, I'm an Oracle developers champion, I already said that. I'm working on JVMs for over 13 years now. And all this time, pretty much on compilers. So I'm a compiler guy. I like it, it's interesting. You know, there's always new stuff. Um, I'd like to call people out at this point. I'm not sure, I'm not sure here, but who, re who remembers GNU GlassPath? No one? No old people here. Like GNU GlassPath? GNU GlassPath? Yeah, no? Oh, yes. Yes, of course, you. Ah, and the old guy back there, yeah. So back in the day, I was working on a different JVM when Java was not free, open sourced. Um, and then there was GNU GlassPath, which was a, a free and open source implementation of the Java library. And, and we all met at Fostem at that time. And you know, have you ever been to Fostem? It's a lot of beer drinking, by the way. Um, so we drank a lot of beer because it was, we were the Wild West and we were liberating Java. And Sun, they were the bad guys. And then 2007, 2008, Sun came up with, you know, oh, here's the source code for Java. And we all said, well, great, yeah. Um, and then. Sun also came to Fostem and we were drinking beer together and they were paying for it, so it was fine. They're still paying for it today, so we let them come. And um, so that was a good time. And then a few years later, I actually decided to start to work for Sun. Um, and I was always part of the Hotspot compiler team, mostly working on C2, a uh, little bit of C1, not that much, but C2 a lot. And the biggest, um, projects I did at Oracle, Sun Oracle, were basically JSR-292, which is Invoke Dynamic Support. So it's support for dynamic languages. Um, John Rose and I were working on this for a long time. Um, I did pretty much all of the compiler support in all the compilers and a little bit of interpreter support. And there were like two different implementations. There was the first one that had some issues, and so we had to rewrite it in a different way, and we moved a lot of that logic um, from the VM into the core library, into Java land, with something called Lambda Forms. You, you might not, not heard this before, but it's, it's an implementation detail. But um, So I was working a lot, I, I wrote a lot of Java code at that time too. Um, so technically, if it doesn't work, you could blame me but I'd like to think that my code was fine when I worked on it and the, the people who touched it after me broke it. So <laughs> I think that's true, by the way. So then I was doing CHEP 243, which I mentioned earlier, JVM CI, the Java level JVM compiler interface. Uh, we took basically the interface that Graal was using and extracted it out of Graal 
and put it in the JDK so that we have it there and you can just grab a build, an open JDK build or an Oracle JDK build, and you can grab Growl from somewhere else like GitHub and then run with it without, modi without the need to modify the JDK. And we also used JVMCI for chapter 295 for ahead of, ahead of time compilation because as I said, it's using Graal. So it's also using JVMCI. That's kind of how it went. And then I had enough of Oracle and I went to Twitter and that's a great company. And also, I live in Hawaii and there is a I organized, I don't have a pointer, but I organized um, a small Ch Java conference in Oahu earlier this year in January. It's called Lava One. Good pun. Was a good pun until they renamed Java One. Now it's whatever. Um, and I don't know how the weather is in Ukraine in January. We were surfing and running around in Borchards on the beach. I'm just saying, so yeah. if you... You are skiing. Oh, it's skiing, yeah, okay, that's cool too. But I'm just saying, if, you're, if you have enough of snow in January, you might buy a plane ticket. Okay, good, let's see where we are. I hope this works now. I should be able to log in. Yes, excellent, very good. So we take that, we log into two... Yeah, the small screens now is a little bit of an issue here, but... Could you please uh, zoom in? Yeah, yeah, there will be a lot of output. I can try. I don't like to do it, but I will do it for you, just for you. <laughs> okay, so... Um, <coughs> what was I doing? I can't remember. You it. We want to get a JDK. Because as I told you, there's nothing installed. Um, I'm not sure how much time I will have today, but I'll just, if we get to it, we don't even have Git, so we have to install Git as well. Um, I don't want 9, I want 10. So we download JDK 10 from the official website. And here we go. That should be pretty quickly. We don't, I don't think we need jazz music for this. Would be nice though. It's still 18 seconds, right? You can swing a little bit. Wow. That's not jazz music. I don't know. Russian jazz music is weird, man. Pretty fast jazz. It is absolutely. Okay, here we go. So <laughs> now we got a JDK. Uh, we are extracting it, and here we go. And then we are setting up. That's that's the typing part, by the way, that can go wrong. So, as you can see, it's already starting. So we have to set Java home, and then we put uh, Java on the path as well, because we're going to use it many, many times. Uh, we're just waiting for this one to finish over here. Here we go. And we are copying this, because we are doing the same stuff over here as well. And this guy. And then, technically, we should have a JDK 10. There you go. Yeah, amazing. Unbelievable. That was the talk. Thank you very much. Um, so as you remember, uh, since, since JDK 9, we have uh, modules, right? And so there is a command line option list modules, and it lists all the modules, plural. Uh, and it's about 75 modules that the JDK has, like all these, right? And we are looking for the modules called jdk.internal.vm and there are three but we're actually looking for two and the first one is jdk.internal.vm.ci that's jvmci so that's the, the the java api part of jvmci there's also a c++ part in the vm that actually you know hands out all the information uh, and then this module jdk.internal.vm.compiler that's just graal it really it's it's just a module that contains graal code so if you have a jdk that has these both, these modules, and since JDK 10, that's true for every operating system, um, then you're good to go. That's really all you need. Okay, while, wait, before I switch back to save some time, we're going to download this color the couple benchmark as well, because we're using it later for many, many things. And while I'm talking, we're downloading this guy. Okay, here we go. So, 
you, you need to get a JDK that has crawl. If you have that module, then you're good to go. So we check that, yeah, ooh, cool, we have it. And then all you have to do is to turn it on. That's really it, okay? So I'll show you now how to use it. Um, we are going to set an environment variable over here first. It's called Java Tool Options. And it's an environment variable that's being picked up automatically by the Java launcher. So I just stick all the command line flags in there so I don't have to type them all the time. Um, as you know, since JDK 9, the default GC is G1. But we are going to look at some GC output today. And G1 output is a little hard to read. And the bigger issue is that G1 has a lot of heuristics and we want the GC to interfere as little as possible because we're comparing compilers. So I'm using parallel GC and I'm actually using a pretty small heap size, 512 uh, megabytes. And I'm using the maximum and start size the same. And the reason for this is um, C2 is written in C++ and Graal is written in Java. So Graal does allocate memory on the Java heap. We talk about this later uh, when it does its work. And so the heap expansion would be different and we don't want that. We want the same, we want the GCs to happen at the same time because we want to compare it. So this is basically my way to try to compare apples and apples. So, and over here, not like this, like this. And we need a bunch more here. So we go, to chap 243, which is the JVMC iChap, and when you scroll at the very bottom down here, you see it tells you how to turn it on. Uh, so JVMC i itself is an experimental VM feature, so you have to unlock these VM options with that guy, and then you tell it, oh, please enable JVMC i, which is not actually enabling the compiler yet, it just tells the VM, oh, just enable the interface that you're actually allowed to use it. And then you tell it, use the JVMCI compiler. That's basically switching out C2 with Graal. And then you could technically name the compiler, but since there, today there's only one, there's no need to name it because, I mean, the selection out of one is pretty straightforward. Okay, here we go. Good. And then we can do a dash Java version. And we see, okay, yes, all our shit is being picked up. Uh, and it just prints the version. That's it. Good. So there's a thing called print flags final. And there are a bunch of um, JVMCI command line options. And these are the ones. And you, as you see, OK, enable JVMCI. We turned it on. It's true. Uh, use JVMCI compiler. It's true. So we're good to go. The one I'm looking for is JVMCI print properties here. So we do that. It's a long list of Java properties. Long list. Okay, there are, there's a handful of JVMCI properties up here, and then the rest is all stuff that you can, you know, change and tune with Graal. So we're not looking at this, obviously, that would take forever. Uh, but the thing we are looking for is this guy, um, init timer. And what it does is, oh yeah, and these are Java properties, right? Because Basically, JVMCI is in Java and Graal is written in Java, so we decided to use Java properties for all, for all the options. And then you do this and you say equals true because it's a Java property, and you, then you do a dash version. What this thing does is it prints out when JVMCI is initializing itself and when it initializes Graal. Okay? So let's do this. Nothing happens, right? So what the hell is going on? Did we do anything wrong? No. The reason why it's not printing anything is because it's lazily initialized. And if I run the same command and we look at all the compilations that are happening, print compilations, now, damn it, not plural this time. I've given this talk so many times and then I still can't do it. Um, these are all the compilations that are happening for a dash version. It's not a lot, it's not, it's not running a lot of Java code, but still a little bit. And now the next question is, uh, who knows what tiered compilation is? Okay, so remember when we talked about C1 and C2? And the way the hotspot, or, and other VMs as well, works is you start up your, your JVM, and then you run your application or your program, it, first it gets interpreted, which is really, really slow. And then you compile it with C1 first, because C1 is a high throughput compiler, its, it's job is to 
produce native code as quickly as possible. It's not as highly optimized, but it's, it's still uh, quickly enough, um, or that the code is still fast enough so that you're, you, you, have, you get a substantial, a substantial improvement. Um, and then you run on C1 compile code for a while, you collect profiling data, and then you use that profiling data to jump to the next tier, the tier four, which is C2, and C2 uses all the profiling data to produce the peak performance code. That's how it works. So you go through tiers. Okay, and so there are basically four, five-ish tier levels. Zero is not really a tier level, that would be interpreted. But one, two, three are all different levels of C1 compilations, and four is the highest tier, C2 or GROB. Okay? And the third column in that output here is the tier level. There is no tier four compilation happening here. So since there's no tier four compilation happening, JVMCI is not even initialized. So what we have to do to actually do this is we have to run a little bit more. So we're using this color, the couple benchmark thingy here. Um, let me copy just that part. And if we run that and the dash L basically just prints out all the uh, benchmarks it has, okay? So it's pretty simple. So if we do this, we'll see, oh yeah, oh, there's some output, right? So. It's actually initializing a class that's called Hotspot JVMCI Runtime, and then we see it's doing some stuff, but it doesn't seem like it's finishing, right? And the reason for this is that a dash L exits before JVMCI is actually done initializing itself. So we never get to the point where we would do a tier four compilation. So we need to run a little bit more even. So we run a small benchmark run of a benchmark called Aurora. Here we go. Okay, here is more output. That looks much, much better. And as you can see, JVMCI this time finishes initialization in 170 milliseconds. Then it, there's something called compiler configuration factory that's selecting the compiler, the JVMCI compiler, since we only have one growl, it's just automatically picking that one. And then it initializes a class called hotspot growl runtime, bunch of other things, the backend for our CPU and you know other, other things that we need. It doesn't really finish, um, or we can't see the, when the initialization finishes, and that's because the, the copper benchmark hardness redirects output into a file at some point, and so we, we don't see it when it ends. Okay, so let me go back to the slides, I think, because we have to talk about bootstrapping. Uh, maybe, no, let me go back to this first. Let me show you this first. So if we run this again, without that output, and run it with C2, that will take about 4.4 seconds, roughly, 4.67. If we run it with Graal, it will take a little bit longer. It's usually, 600, no, this time it's a little bit more. It's like 800 milliseconds longer, okay? And for a benchmark, that's five seconds long. That's, that's a little bit more than you would like, I guess. But the, the reason for this is, and now we're going back to the slides, um, we have to do something that's called a bootstrap. And because Graal is just another Java application running in your JVM, right? So it's Java code and so on, it, has, it loads Java classes, right? And then it has Java methods itself. And these, these methods need, at some point, need to be compiled as well. Because if, Graal, if you want Graal to compile your application code, your application methods, you need Graal to be fast to do that, so it needs to be compiled it's before as well while it's doing it, and that's called a bootstrap. It's like the, a meta-circular approach, right? If you, if you have something, if you have part of your JVM written in the same language that it's actually running, you have a meta-circular <laughs> issue. You could technically, if I had the time, we could AOT compile Graal, and all this goes away. But for now, for this demo, and I can also tell you, since we at Twitter, we, we run still on Java 8, and Java 8 doesn't have AOT compilation, and so, we just run in this bootstrapping mode, okay? So let me show you this real quick. You can do, and you should not, do an explicit bootstrap. And it, that looks like this. So you can tell JVMCI to bootstrap the compiler, and it looks like this. So it's bootstrapping it, every dot is 100 methods compiled, and this will take roughly 
10 seconds. There you go. So no one would wait 10 seconds for his JVM to start up, right? I mean, think about small, no one's really using Java for command line tools, but that's like the worst case scenario, right? You don't want your LS implementation in Java to take 10 seconds before it's printing something. But if we go back to the example that I showed you earlier, oh, I, I could, I'm not sure how much time I have, but I, I'm not doing it. If I turn off tier compilation, it takes even, much, it takes, I think, 25 seconds because then we don't have C1 anymore and Graal would compile itself with itself um, takes even longer. If we go back to this benchmark here and we do three iterations, let me do the three iterations here first. Uh, that's, the, that's exactly uh, the, the time where the jazz music should come on. But it's only, ah, look, amazing. And cocktails should be served. <laughs> I don't know, what, what party is this? Okay, so as you can see, it takes about 4.4, 4.2, 4.34-ish seconds to run with C2. And over here, you remember the first run was slower, yes? But if, if you look at the other runs, they're kind of already at the same performance as C2. And the reason for this is the bootstrap that we did explicitly is happening implicitly in the background. So you remember we have, we have a container that has four cores and what was it? Nothing, nothing. nothing. Ah, nothing. Okay, good. Um, so we have a container with, with more cores so, and you want that because you want, as I said, your GC to run in parallel. So you have a bunch of GC threads, but what the JVM also has is a bunch of compiler threads. Right? And, and since we're not collecting all the time with our GCs, there are a bunch of unused cores laying around. And the JVM is using these cores to compile. And everything we need to compile, oh, by the way, I, I forgot to mention this, like the bootstrap compile about 2,500 methods if you saw that. So that's quite a lot. Um, it's probably more than this benchmark actually compiles. Um, so in all these methods we need to compile our, our application methods, um, these are compiled, the graph methods are compiled in the background. And this is what you're seeing in these, how much is this now, 800 milliseconds, which is much, much shorter than 10 seconds. And it's not really even noticeable because as you can see, we only run like five seconds. And then after 10 seconds, we're already at the same speed, right? So this whole bootstrap situation, um, and I can tell you from experience because we at Twitter, we use a Graal for a bunch of our services and we, we deploy, and we have thousands of instances of our services and we deploy them, some of them we deploy them multiple times a week and we never had an issue with the bootstrap to be too slow. It's really not a problem. Good, so that's what the bootstrap is. I should also mention, I always forget this, um, I don't know, how much time do I have left? <coughs> I was told someone sitting there knowing the time Oh, okay, cool. Oh, whatever. I'll talk as long as you want. I have, I have a lot to say. Um, so I'll skip that. But um, I'll just tell you that the, the default uh, setup, the way Hotspot works with tier compilation, if you run with Graal, is Graal methods itself. There's this flag. Yeah, I think it's on the next slide. There's a flag that um, that tells the VM to only compile Graal methods with C1. And the reason for this is because C1 produces code quickly because we want Graal to be ready and to be fast enough to compile your application. Okay, that's how it works. Good, so bootstrapping as we saw compiled about 2,500 methods. If we turn tiered off, it's, it's even more, it's almost like 5,000. So it's a lot of methods that are being compiled and you can do it either upfront, don't do that, or on demand, right? That's what we saw. It's like the 600 to 800 milliseconds that really don't matter. Um, and then, as I just said, by default, on demand compiles Graal with C1 only. That's that's also important because we need Graal to be to be you know quick as quickly as possible. So we have to talk now about Java heap usage, because those of you who pay attention will remember that Graal is exactly very important. So obviously. 
when you compile your application, and remember that graph methods are compiled by C1 only, so that's not an issue. C1 is C++ and it, it allocates memory with malloc on the, C on the native C heap. But when Graal is compiling your application or, your, or the benchmark we're using, um, it uses Java heap memory to do that. And that's obviously a very different attribute and property of Graal compared to C2. That's where a lot of people get, get hung up when they run their benchmarks because they look at GC numbers and things like that and they say, whoa, what the fuck's going on? Where's this coming from? Um, but it's just Graal doing its job. So let's do a quick keep demo here. And we use the same benchmark. We use three iterations here and we just turn GC logging on and it looks like this. Um, the the cup of benchmark hardness cleans up the heap before and after the run. These are these collections, the system.gc ones. Uh, Aurora in general is a very compute intense benchmark. It does not allocate a lot of memory. You see after the first run we only allocated like 39 megs and after the second one only 32. So it's, there's really nothing going on. It's just crunching numbers. Um, and there are absolutely no GCs happening during the benchmark runs. Okay, if we run that same thing over here, return. We see, oh yeah, okay, yeah, there are GCs happening, there's a little more going on. Um, and this is exactly that Graal is doing its job. It's compiling benchmark methods. And as you can see here, we're doing quite a bit because we're, com we, we're allocating up to 130 megs and then collect down, uh, again, 130 meg collect down. Um, there's another 92 after the benchmark run. And at warm up two, there's, there's still one collection left, and it's, it's about the same size, but once we hit the third iteration, there's no GC anymore. And the reason for this is that compilations, chip compilations of your application always happen at the very beginning of your application run. Uh, and this is what we're seeing here. That's why this one, this runs slower, right? Because we're still, we're running a little bit longer interpreted and we do the collections, um, but then down here, we run at the same speed as C2. And at that point, compilations are done, right? Depending, obviously, on the size of your application, there will be more to be compiled, but that also means that it takes longer to start up, right? Good. Yes. 20? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Cool. We can do a lot of shit in 20 minutes. So, Graal uses Java heap memory, as I said. Today, there is no heap isolation. That's a little bit of an issue because everyone, including us at Twitter, tunes their Java heap size to exactly how much you need, right? Because it means money. If you have, if you have your application in the cloud and you're paying for it, you're paying for memory, right? So you want to use that memory as good as you can. So you, you give your application exactly as much memory as it needs. Uh, during your stable state, and then may maybe a megabyte more because it might use a little bit more at some point. Um, and then if Graal comes in and suddenly uses 200, 300 megabytes of memory to compile a method, that's a problem, right? Because you will get an out-of-memory error. So if you're really lucky, that out-of-memory error will get delivered on a compiler thread, which is, would be totally fine because the compiler then just catches the out of memory error and says, oh, okay, I don't have memory, I don't, I'm not compiling this method, whatever. But you're still running. But if that out of memory error will get delivered in the application, eh, that might be an issue, right? Your application might not be ready for that and it might go down. So that's an issue. There are, there are multiple ways to solve that problem. And by the way, that problem is not solved. Just saying. Um, but we'll get there. And I also can tell you, um, as I said, we run thousands and thousands of instances of Twitter microservices on Graal, and we never had a single issue with that. We never had an, a service go down because of out-of-memory error. When you most, yeah, I have to change that slide. Let me do that right now because I, most Graal memory usage during startup. That's, that's important because people are confused. Most Graal memory usage is during startup because as I said, most of the compilations happen during your application startup. And at that time, and I again can use Twitter as a very good example, um, your application is not even fully up yet, right? You start up your application, then it, especially in a microservices world, it needs to come up first and then it needs to connect to a, to a bunch of other services before it can even do its work. Then most of the services do a tiny little warm-up loop to get a little hot and then they are ready to accept uh, you know, production requests, uh, production traffic. 
And at that time, you're already done compiling everything, right? So this is really not an issue. And also remember, um, the memory is being used anyway. It's either used on the Java, on the Java heap, in the case of Graal, or it's used on the native C heap by, allocated by malloc with C2. There's no difference. They, they both need to build up um, application graphs and they can be big and, and so on and so on. So in, especially in the cloud world, in the, with a container where you, you pay for memory, let's say you, know, you, you buy a container that has four gigabytes of memory, okay? And then you can't give all four gigabytes to the, ch to the JVM because you know that the compilers will allocate memory in the native heap. So you need some, some memory there as well. So in the case of Graal, you could technically give the JVM a little bit more memory. A lot of strange things happening here. Um, but the memory is being used anyway. So you're not saving or, or giving any memory away. Good. She said 10 minutes. Um, I can do... What can I do in 10 minutes? Okay, let's, let's do that. Um, I want to show you... We want Graal. Here we go, that's the Oracle Graal repo. Um, it's pretty big. So we are copying this guy and then we clone it here, git clone. And I'm doing a depth of one because it, it got pretty big. And this is a little risky right now because it could be that the, that the tip right now does not build. So we'll see how that goes. Um, and then the other thing we need is a small, no, well, it's actually not that small. But it's, it's, a, it's a script called MX. And it's basically a huge Python script that Oracle Labs is using for pretty much everything. So if they use it as a build system, they use it to, to run their tests, blah, blah, blah. They, they use it to start up IDEs and con create IDE configurations and, and whatnot. So we need that. We put that on the path. Uh, yeah, this guy path, here we go, and then we go into the Graal repo directory here. This contains everything of Graal VM. Oh, I forgot to mention this at the very beginning. Um, I'm not talking about Graal VM here, right? Graal VM is this marketing term that Oracle Labs is, you know, throughout in the world, which is super annoying because they're overloading a term. Um, I'm only talking about Graal the compiler, right? I'm not talking about Truffle. I'm not talking about Substrate VM. I don't really care. If you want to run JavaScript and JRuby and R on the VM, do it. But we don't because all of our shit is written in Scala. Good. So we go into the compiler directory here. And then the script MX. Yeah, we maybe. No, I, I'll leave it in there. It's, it doesn't matter. We'll have additional output, but it doesn't really matter. So all you have to do, I've, I've set up Java Home. You remember that. So all you have to do is an MX build. And that's really all. And then it just builds all the Java shit. Yeah, that output, no, you ignore that. Um, it downloads a bunch of, as you can see here, it, down, it downloads a bunch of dependencies it has. Uh, so it builds that. I will take a little bit, not too long. Uh, this build will fail. And the reason why it will fail is because it builds a tiny little part for Truffle. And Truffle uh, uses libffi. And libffi is a, is a C++, a C library, right? And so to build that part, it needs GCC. Well, guess what? You think my cloud instance has GCC installed? Of course not. So that's the part, for example, where you know I would have to prepare it. I could download GCC, it just takes forever, so I'm not doing it. I just let the build fail, it's still fine. So this is what we want to see, building Java module for Graal, this guy, okay. Build failed, that's cool, no one cares. Um, this, is the, this is the module, the jar file we're looking for, okay? So we got this guy. Over here, we do, what are we doing? Um, yeah, we run that benchmark again, that's actually a good uh, example. So we do that, uh, and oops. And we do remove this, and what else do we want? Oh yeah, we want to log class loading. And so we are grabbing for uh, Graal VM. I think that's what the classes are called these days. Here we go, yeah, exactly. So let me control C that before it, oh my God. Okay, so these are all the, the, the Graal classes uh, that are being loaded. And as you can see, they're loaded from something called JRT. That's the internal file system for modules. 
and then it loads it from this module, the VM compiler module that we saw earlier, okay? So you can also run this thing. Ah, I haven't set it up here yet. Oh, wait, okay, we gotta do this. Um, export path and yeah, here we go. And then we go Graal compiler. So we run this. Now let me show you something else first. So you can do an MXVM dash version, for example, that's basically just taking uh, the, the module at Jarfa we just built and, and puts it on the path and then it just runs the JVM. And if we do a dash V here, we actually see what it's doing. And we're looking for this command line here, right? That's really executing Java. I'm still using service, so stupid. But um, there's this upgrade module path here, right? And so as you can see, the module, the JVM internal, uh, JDK internal .vm .compiler module is being upgraded to the one we built, okay? So if we run, let me go back, where are we here? So if we do this mxvm, and then we have to say this here, and we grab for these classes, you can see these classes are now being loaded from our file, okay? That's really all you have to do. You can either use mx, which is super simple, or you, you put that upgrade module path in your parameters, and, and then you're also running on the latest Grub version. So um, we can now do, I can't remember how, uh, yeah, no, we, I think we, we can remember. It was like four point something seconds, right? So if we run that benchmark with the latest version of Graal, I always hope that it's faster, but it never is. And I don't think it will be this time. No. All right. Anyway, but that's, that's really all you have to do. And so you, you clone it from, from GitHub, you load it up, you're in the favorite IDE, Whatever that ID is, where's Anton? It's definitely not IntelliJ. Um, and, um, and then you can play around if you want to. Uh, you know, we need people to, to work on compilers. We need people to, to fix bugs and so on. So if you're interested, do it. Try it out. Um, good. Probably have five minutes left. <laughs> yeah, good. So I'm not doing the, yeah, I did that. I'm not doing the production demo, that would take too long, but I show you something else, um, and it's a Scala demo, and then you'll see why Twitter saves a lot of money by using Graal. So we are running the benchmark, no wait, not yet. We have to change something else. We have to use a, a little bit bigger heap size, because otherwise we get too many collections. And then we run a benchmark called, and we do two iterations, two is enough, of a benchmark called factory. And we do the same over here. And this one takes, ah, wait, no, 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 wrong. We need to look at GC output. That's what we want. So, okay, we let this run. This will take about, one iteration takes about 25 seconds to run with C2. And as you can already see, it's doing a lot of work, right? So it's, it's allocating a lot. If we go back here to the, the couple benchmark website, and then there's this benchmarks link, there's all the, the Scala benchmarks, factory. So the factory benchmark, toolkit for deployable probabilistic modeling to extract topics using latent treatish whatever. Right? No one really knows what it does. Um, I don't. I met a guy, um, where was this? I think at GeekCon like two days ago. And so I, I, you know, I say this all the time because I still have no fucking clue what it's doing. And so after my talk, he came up to me and he said, oh yeah, blah, 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 we're using LDA in production. And I said, what? What are you talking about, right? You're using LDA in production. They are using latent whatever it is. I don't know what they're doing. Really, I don't. But it was funny. Okay, so this is done. And, ah, same mistake. Damn it. I did the same mistake again. I don't want a small run. I want a default run. Sorry, I have to do this again. But I'll buy you a drink later. Or someone else. Good. Okay, so we're just getting more collections, it's doing a little bit of more work, um, so it's more representative. Um, 
this will take the first warm-up iteration. It, there's a little bit more stuff going on. It builds up data structures, blah, blah, blah. It compiles more stuff. So it takes a little bit longer. And then this is the second run and all the other runs because it takes quite, you know, 25 seconds for benchmark run. It's already a pretty good size. Um, and then the second, third, or fourth run, they're all the same. So we, we only have to do two. We are going to end up about 40 GCs during the one benchmark iteration. So we start at 49. Okay. I don't know. Someone, someone's calling me. Um, 49, we start at GC 49, and we end up at 87, which is, yeah, 38, 38 GCs, like 40 GCs pretty much. And as you can see, as I said, we, we, we allocate up to 740, 50 megabytes, and we collect down to 74 all the time. So it, there's a lot of work going on, okay? And it took 25, 26 milliseconds to do this. Okay, let's run this one with, uh, with Grob. <laughs> What are, what, are they what are they talking about? I don't understand. It's a question. It's a question? <laughs> a question for me, you think? Exactly. Yeah. They're talking probably about Grau. Yeah. They might. I know. Ah, damn it. They're, they're confusing me because I forgot to increase the heap size here, so we have to do that again. Don't, don't ask questions while I'm typing. Are these good questions or no? No? Uh, the obvious ones. The obvious ones, okay. Yeah, I don't want to answer obvious questions. Okay, we have to wait for this again. But as you will see pretty soon, especially with this already first benchmark run, um, it will be much quicker, faster than the other one because this one's done in 17 seconds compared to 25. Would you mind using this? Would you mind using this? Um, I can now, because I don't have to type anymore, yeah. And uh, you also want me to sing later with the jazz band? I can do that too. That would be great. Yeah, okay, here we go. So let's get this finished. So as you can see, 17 seconds compared to 25, 26, that's a huge speed up, right? Uh, and we just switched out the compiler, that's all. And that's basically for free. Um, and we started at 30 and we ended up at 48, that's roughly 20 GCs. So we cut the GCs in half, which is ridiculous. And the reason for this is that uh, inlining, Graal's inlining implementation works slightly differently and better than C2s. And then there's one additional point to this is, um, I don't know how many people know what escape analysis is, I'm not going to explain it now, but uh, there's, there's a very, you know, textbook implementation of escape analysis in C2, but Graal has a little more uh, advanced version of that, which is called partial escape analysis, and so it can, it can eliminate more object allocations. And since Graal is inlining more, escape analysis can work much better. And it, for this particular benchmark, it can eliminate half of the memory that's allocated. This is ridiculous. But, you know, remember, this is a talk that I'm giving, and of course I'm picking the bench, best benchmark out there that, that exists, right? I mean, I would be stupid to show you one where there's a 1% improvement, right? I want to look good. Um, but if you watch that other talk that I was talking about earlier, um, the Twitter's quest for Holy Grail runtime, you'll see how much Twitter is saving. It's not 50%, it's not right? And it's not what, how much is this 25% in runtime, uh, but it's a, it's a substantial amount. So this is the part at the very beginning when I said, why I want you to try it, because you could potentially save money by reducing CPU utilization, using less instances of whatever you were running. Okay, good, back to the slides then. This is my summary of the talk. It's really very simple. That's it. That's, that's all I want you to do. And I mean, no, I, I don't want a show of hands, but I know that not very many people are running JDK 9 or 10 in production, right? We are, we are not either, but there are other ways to run, for example, an 8. We build our own JDK that's slightly different, but Oracle Labs provides you with a Java 8 that also has Graal in it, so you can try it that way. Uh, I would really appreciate if you could take JDK 10, for example, and run maybe not in production. That would be cool, though, but, you know, uh, just run whatever you have. 
right? Maybe you're, maybe you're developing a new product or a new service and you're still testing it somewhere on the side. Just use it there, try it, give it a try. Yeah, this, this, I have to get off stage really, this is getting ridiculous. Um, embarrassing, okay. Um, yes, so if you have time, try it. If it works, great, let me know. Uh, if it doesn't work, even better. If it crashes, perfect, file a bug. Uh, because that means that we at Twitter won't hit that bug and Twitter should be up 100% of the time because everyone in this room has a Twitter account and you all would be bummed out if it doesn't work, right? No one's using Facebook in Ukraine. <laughs> That's what I heard. Okay, good. That's it. Thank you very much.